Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is the founder and CEO of the Play Therapy Institute of Colorado and the creator of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode from the Lessons from the Playroom webinar and podcast series. This is episode number 31, and the today's topic is going to be on selective mutism in the playroom. This topic was a listener request. I'm just absolutely loving how much feedback we are getting from listeners regarding this podcast. Ideas, questions, conversations, insights, I mean, all of it. I really appreciate how much time you guys are taking to send feedback my way. And as always, if you have a topic that you would love something about, I will do my best to offer something for you. And if I don't know, I will go find somebody that does and try to support your learning. This is lessons from the playroom. This is about helping us feel more masterful in the room within ourselves and being able to facilitate the child's process in play therapy. So if I can offer something that's useful in that direction, then let's do that. So um, as I started to dive into the topic for today, it became apparent really quickly that this is a really big topic and easily this could be a three hour course, if not a full day training, mostly because there's so many misdiagnoses with selective mutism and a lot of misunderstandings about what's going on for the kiddo. So I'm going to ask you to go back and listen to episode number 18 also, which is on when a child doesn't speak in the playroom. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this in this episode, I do mention there. It's just a really good review, but I'm going to highlight some things in this episode that I didn't and vice versa. There's things in that episode that I'm not going to talk about in this particular episode. So I think between episode 18 and this episode, I think that you'll get a really nice um understanding or at least some ideas about what to do, how to move forward if you have a kiddo in your playroom that is not speaking for whatever reason. So let's just go ahead and dive in and get going on this topic. So for those of you that are not very familiar with selective mutism, it is actually considered an anxiety disorder. And one of the things that we have to start to flesh out is what's actually going on. I mentioned that there's a lot of misunderstanding, there's a lot of misdiagnosis, so we're gonna talk about that in this episode for sure. And then I'm also gonna share some different experiences I've had in the playroom with kiddos that are struggling to speak. We're gonna try to put a, put a picture together for you. But one of the things when we're looking at selective mutism as an anxiety disorder that is important to understand is that the person who is has selective mutism is actually normally capable of speech. So they do tend to speak in some areas of their lives. Usually the selective mutism shows up in very specific situations or to specific people. So one may be a child who goes to school and they spend the entire day at school completely silent and then they come home and they're just talking, 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 talking. Or a child who is able to speak normally and then there's this one particular family member, as an example, that they just go mute around and they will not talk to this individual. It often coexists with shyness and there is a really, really, really high correlation between selective mutism and social anxiety. So when we're looking at how to work with this in the playroom, one of the things we might want to consider is we're actually working with the anxiety that is underneath the 
the um, underneath the symptom of not speaking. So I think that let's let's begin to conceptualize it that way. That the the child not speaking is just a symptom of something else going on inside. Also, individuals that um, have selective mutism, they will stay silent even when the consequences of the silence, they may include shame, they may include punishment, they may include being socially ostracized in some way, but there's something going on for them where they just will not speak. So that leads me to the next thing for us to talk about in terms of misunderstanding. So some of you may not know this, but it wasn't actually until 1994, I believe is when the date was, when the term selective mutism was actually decided on as the term to use with children and and adults too, but with children who are not able to speak in certain situations. Before that, it was actually called elective mutism because people actually thought that there was a choice, right? You could elect to choose in one situation versus another. And what we now know is that's not necessarily the case, that there are many individuals that are struggling with selective mutism that they want to talk. They want to be able to say something and they just literally cannot. And so it's not so much a I want to or I don't and I'm just choosing not to, that there's actually something going on more from a physiological perspective that is allowing the child or not allowing the child, excuse me, to be able to express and to and to speak freely. So that's really important because I think that sometimes children, adults in these children's lives can get really frustrated, particularly when they see the child being able to speak in one area and then not in the other, and they assume that there's a choice there. Another thing to understand about selective mutism is there's this interesting, let's call it a, like a hierarchical variation. So I'll give you some examples here. So one child, for example, may be able to like fully participate in all, in in many activities, appear really, really social, um, but they don't speak. So they're participating, but without any language. Others will only speak, for example, to their peers, and they won't speak to adults at all. Others may speak to adults, um, but never to peers. And sometimes the children that will speak to adults and not to peers, they'll only answer, like, let's say if they're being asked a question and their answers are, like, really, really short, or they perceive that they only have to give a really short answer. And then still within that hierarchy, still other children will speak to no one and and they won't participate in much at all. So they're also socially withdrawn. And, and then you get into like a severe form of selective mutism, which is actually called progressive mutism. And this progresses until the child no longer speaks to anyone in any situation whatsoever, even close family members. So you can see that there really is this range. There's a a hierarchy um, of how it can manifest. It doesn't always just show up one particular way. There's also some other different behaviors and characteristics that can show up. So I'm just going to point those out just for offer some education. So we've already talked about shyness and that oftentimes there's a correlation between social anxiety. There can be a huge fear of social embarrassment, social social isolation, and even like a withdrawal. Um, Some kiddos have a really difficult time maintaining eye contact. Sometimes they're really reluctant even to smile. Like they, they really start to shut down There can even be a blank expression. So I'm going to talk here in a minute about the the hypo-aroused experience that can present with some of these kiddos. And the blank expression and a reluctance to smile can also be part of the hypo-aroused nervous system response. Really difficulty expressing feelings. Um, The anxiety part, so they can have a tendency to worry more than a lot of um, children their same age. And then also sensitivity to noise and crowds. So let's go ahead and start to look at uh, some different 
uh, other, let's say, diagnoses or other situations that we need to rule out when we have a kiddo that isn't speaking. So I just mentioned sensitivity to noise and crowds. So some kiddos that have sensory processing challenges, they are in an environment and they are having trouble processing all the sensory experience and because of that, their system is legitimately overwhelmed and flooded, and therefore they start to shut down and withdrawal in an attempt to just block out sensory data. So that child who's very sensorily aroused may actually be choosing not to speak. And again, when I say choice, I don't want you to think of it as a conscious choice. Their system literally may be choosing not to speak as a way to protect because their system is so activated and so flooded that it's actually a protective mechanism in the body. So really important that we look at sensory processing issues and do we need to rule those out or are they contributing and how are they contributing in some way. Another misdiagnosis can be autism. So it's often confused with autism, particularly if a child is being evaluated and in that situation where they're being evaluated, they then choose not to speak. And again, I'm just gonna caution when I say the word choice to really understand what I'm saying when I say that word choice, that sometimes uh, the child can present in a way where they look like they're on the spectrum, but they're not really on the spectrum. So we want to rule that out as well. And then let's start now looking actually into the play therapy room itself, because sometimes the child may be totally talking out in the waiting room, but when they get into the play room with you, now all of a sudden they're completely silent. And this is where it might be helpful to refer back to episode number um, 18. But we really need to look at is the reason why the child also not speaking in the playroom and then also at home, are they actually regressed? Are they in an earlier emotional age? If they're, for whatever reason, if they are really emotionally regressed, you may have more childlike qualities and more childlike behaviors. And one of those can be going back to a state where they're not speaking much. Or if they're not speaking, if they're speaking a little bit, it's maybe small words or short sentences, but it seems like they are you know, not speaking at their full capacity. So we want to look at, at regression. And then the other really big one is we want to look at trauma. So when a child has perceived an event or something as highly, highly traumatic one of the most wise and intelligent things that the system can do is start to shut down out of fear in order to move into a place of self-preservation. So that's what I want to talk a little bit more about and probably for the rest of this particular podcast since a lot of what we do see in the playroom, it happens to be trauma-related. And, and when I say trauma, I don't necessarily mean a huge trauma from a synergetic play therapy perspective and or from a neuroscience perspective, I tend to define trauma as something that the child just isn't able to integrate. It was too much for their nervous system to hold. It was too big. So as a little review here of the nervous system states, when a child is encountering something that is a challenge, they will activate their autonomic nervous system to do something about that challenge. And one of the responses that can be chosen is to activate the dorsal parasympathetic response. And that was the part of the nervous system that starts to move the child into a more withdrawn collapse state. And very much this is where you can see a child start to pull inward they can start to lose their, their, their speech because literally the whole the system is shutting down. If they continue and continue, continue, you can literally move into a response called the dorsal dive where the whole system just completely shuts down. The child can even pass out at that point. But my point is this. If a child has experienced something incredibly overwhelming in their world, the child moving into a shutdown, more collapsed, protective pattern is incredibly, incredibly useful. And within that, often the language can go. 
It often corresponds also with just other regressive states, emotional age, going younger, that type of an experience as well. And so let me give you an example of a kiddo that I had in my, my playroom when how we worked through this. So this was a little girl that I worked with. She was in first grade and she had been a witness to about a year's worth of domestic violence in her home. And the domestic violence was between, it was from dad towards mom in the home. And pr her uh, loss of speech was actually a progression. So she um, started to display signs of anxiety when the domestic violence began. And as it continued over the course of that year, she started to display more and more fears. She started to have more anxiety type symptoms. And eventually her speech actually left. And for her, when she um, lost her, her speech, it was actually across the board. So she wasn't speaking very much at home anymore. And this was still when the domestic violence was occurring in the house. So she stopped speaking at home. She stopped speaking at school, which is then when she started to come to see me. And at the point when she came to see me was right actually when things had started to shift at home and the father was removed from the home. Now, having said that, even though she was now in a safe environment, she, we still had the experience of the trauma to work through. And so one of the things recognizing what was happening in her nervous system that was really key for me to do as um, the play, her play therapist was not to force her to speak. It's probably going to be the biggest advice that I'm going to give you. If a child is not speaking, don't force them to speak. There is a protective pattern. There is something quite brilliant that is happening that we need to honor and respect within the child. And when we force them to speak, we're actually moving them outside and potentially outside and potentially um, into a place where they can be flooded even more. So part of me allowing her to not speak was beginning to allow her to titrate a bit back and forth, moving towards the trauma, away from the trauma, towards the trauma, away from the trauma. I also was very non-directive with her in how I was facilitating her play experience. Again, just allowing her to do what she needed to do, really trusting the therapeutic powers of play in this particular experience, really trusting her nervous system, trusting that she has within what it takes to heal. And then it was my job just to help guide her and to help her feel back towards a relationship with herself because she had disconnected from herself in the midst of all this trauma and she had disconnected from a sense of being able to have a voice and her ability to use the voice. She chose a lot of sand tray work so I really facilitated her process in the sand tray and I did it in many different ways. Um, sometimes I would just make small comments Sometimes I would actually just breathe and bring in some regulation in my own body so she could borrow my regulatory capacity to help her move closer to what she was attempting to create um, in the tray. But I definitely um, really tried to work hard at making sure that I wasn't flooding her by talking too much or being too intrusive into her process. Again, recognizing and honoring that her mutism was an important part of her experience. Now within this also, I noticed that she became emotionally younger in the play. And so we actually had those two pieces going on. Not only was she did she lose her voice as a symptom of the trauma, but she was also emotionally really young. And so in the course of the, of the sessions and through her sand tray work, we worked at helping her grow up a little bit more. And as I'm saying that, and listeners, you may go, yes, but how did you do that? Whatever play therapy modality that you are trained in is brilliant. It's beautiful. I used a combination of, at the time, a little bit of the child-centered, um, a lot of synergetic play therapy, a lot of my understanding of how to facilitate sand, um, a sand tray experience, but you use whatever modality that you have been trained in. 
I just want to orient you around a child's nervous system is flooded if they are in the place of selective mutism in the room. And if they're working with a trauma, it's really important that you bring in some type of a regulatory force, but really give the child a lot of permission to flow in and out of rather than expecting them to talk, going incredibly um, directive with the child, expecting them to make eye contact because it's just too much for their, too much for their system in, in all probability. So it was probably about session six or seven when she started to say one word. And then by about session nine or 10, she started to say sentences. And by about sessions, I would say 12 to 13, we were back into making full, uh, full sentences. And the play had gone from just directive, or not, excuse me, not directive, just being in the sand tray towards more relational, towards more dramatic play, to um, ultimately being more age, more age appropriate. So I'm going to invite you listeners right now for you to take a breath with me. And in many ways, this invitation that I'm offering right now for you to take a breath for a pause is a bit like what I would encourage you to do in the room with the clients. Just pause, breathe, allow the kiddo that is highly anxious, who's overwhelmed, who's flooded, whose nervous system has so brilliantly moved into a place of not speaking, to just borrow your breath, to invite a deep sense of presence in the room, which allows their amygdala to begin to settle which allows their ventral parasympathetic branch to begin to engage to which ultimately allows their their social engagement system to begin to come alive and for a child that has some social phobias to really be able to learn how to um, engage that that social system inside of them it's really important for them to trust that it's okay for them to show up, that it's okay for them to move from a place of dysregulation back to a place of regulation to begin to allow their system to settle so they can open and ultimately connect. So the last piece of this that I'm going to leave us on has to do with um, the fears. So another child that I worked with his presentation of selective mutism was very much around a particular person and it happened to be his father. And what was really clear early on is that this child felt embarrassed, felt highly criticized, um, was in a sense subordinating to um, his father's authority, was afraid of being scolded, was afraid to really be himself. And because of that, he had moved himself into such a strong fear response that he didn't, he was so afraid to answer dad's questions. He was so afraid to ask dad because he so badly didn't want to get in trouble, didn't want to shut down and be ridiculed in some way. And so for him, his selective mutism really showed up again around a specific person so that's what we worked on in the play therapy experience was helping him feel okay about himself, helping him recognize that it was okay for him to speak up. Um, I also did a lot of work with dad to help dad to have a very authoritative parenting style, to help dad be able to consider different ways of approaching his son. But ultimately the work in the playroom was to help this child once again find his voice because he had felt like he had lost his voice relative to his father. So whether the kiddo has had an ongoing trauma, whether they are um, afraid to speak out for whatever reason, whether it's at school or with a peer or with a parent, whether it is just a significant sense of anxiety and a strong social phobia, Whatever play therapy model, I mentioned this before, is is brilliant um, for this. Play therapy is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant modality to work with selective mutism because it is so non-threatening, particularly if you use a non-directive approach with these kiddos. And just remember, their nervous system's already flooded. They're already shut down. It already feels like too much. So take lots of deep breaths in the playroom. 
let the child titrate in and out of moving towards what they need to work on, moving away from it, moving towards it, moving away from it. Let them borrow your regulatory capacity and I guarantee over time as the child learns how to regulate their own nervous system, as a child learns how to connect with themselves and how to attach to themselves more fully, pretty soon they will find their words and find their way back towards being able to, to fully express. So listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode. I so look forward to being with you again next time. Take care. And remember, you are that most important toy in the playroom.